Welcome to the World Today. I'm Vikas Majid Khan. Today we have three important topics to discuss. The first one, of course, is the uh, Pakistan-US relationship, its trajectory in the wake of the uh, recent visit of Ambassador Alice Wells. Uh, she came to Pakistan and uh, had a very good uh, conversation with the leadership in Pakistan. And we hope that uh, the trajectory for Pakistan-US relations will be given the appropriate course correction and uh, our next topic is uh, also talking about uh, the Afghan uh, problem. No more extension in stay has been given for the Afghan refugees. Uh, the UNHCR has also uh, made some uh, observations regarding that. We'll be talking about that in detail. And finally, our last topic is about the massive amount of weapons that India is now amassing. Uh, they are going to be buying 160,000 guns worth $553 million uh, for their border troops, uh, 500,000 of which are in Kashmir. And of course, they're also amassing weapons uh, for their northern borders. Let's get the conversation started. I'd like to introduce my guests in the studio. Joining me today, we have first of all Salman Bertani Saab with us, and with him, we have Kamar Chima. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. Uh, Bertani Saab, we'll start with you. Uh, very uh, interesting sounds being made by Ambassador Alice Wells, uh, especially when you juxtapose it with the tweet of Mr. Trump. Uh, her tone was uh, very uh, uh, motivational, one would say. Uh, she urged the government of Pakistan to address the continuing presence of the Haqqani network and other terrorist groups within the country, while we have already said that there are no safe uh, havens for any terrorists, and we do not even now, uh, you know, there are no good or bad terrorists as such. So. In your opinion, do you think that the Pakistani um, uh, leadership was able to convince uh, the American leadership of our point of view? Well, I think uh, they are, uh, sometimes I get a feeling that they are playing good, pa good cop, bad cop uh, kind of diplomacy because the tone that uh, uh, was reiterated by time and again by Donald Trump was really difficult. Then the tone that the other uh, uh, important leaders, uh, leadership from either the uh, defense sector or foreign policy side of U.S. Uh, governance, they have a different tone. Uh, last time we also witnessed the same course of action when uh, uh, the August 21 speech was uh, being aired and then uh, Mike Pence kind of uh, tried to do the ice breaking and again now we have seen that this the same course of action is going on. Uh, but th this time uh, what I feel that the, the study that we have and the, the kind of narrative that have been built in international media as well, that Pakistani uh, opinion has also been uh, uh, spelled out. As in, because there have been a lot of hue and cry in international media and all international networks. So this uh, uh, Trump's tweet has uh, uh, got some, uh, 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 some dual impact as well. He wanted to uh, be very harsh on Pakistan, but since this, this thing came in discourse and people started discussing about it. So naturally, automatically, people also discussed about Pakistani view, in which we say that we have lost around 60,000 civilians, 7, 8,000 soldiers, $123 billion of our uh, infrastructural damage. So that was also flagged in international media outlets. Uh, that somehow, I think, influenced uh, uh, those sane voices in, in US administration. Obviously, you cannot end a relationship which, which is spanned on six or seven decades and that have different contours of strategy and politics and to some extent economics as well. I mean, US has been providing us uh, the biggest Fulbright scholarship program. So it's not possible that uh, the, all those programs will be halted and uh, US would not need Pakistan. Everybody knows it, that Pakistan is required, Pakistan's role is required in this region, particularly as far as the Afghan question is concerned. Uh, with Haqqanis, without Haqqanis, Haqqanis this or Haqqanis that, uh, that's a separate thing. That, 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 has, uh, that nuance has a very minor technical value. Uh, otherwise, Pakistan's political role, Pakistan's instrumental role is very important in the region. Absolutely. You know, uh, Chima Saab, uh, another thing that came out from Alice Wells' conversation was that the U.S. wanted to shift uh, to a new relationship uh, paradigm with Pakistan and that which is based on mutual interest. Uh, how do you view this particular statement? Because with, as far as Pakistan is concerned, we've already uh, reiterated that we do not, we're not interested in American money or their dollars or aid. Uh, we just want uh, respect for what we have done in the past and what we're continuing to do. So what kind of mutual interest would she be hinting at? I think um, what she's talking today is uh, this is what Pakistan has been talking for long. 
Uh, for instance, she said that uh, Taliban are the part of the social and the political fabric of Afghanistan. This is what we are talking. Uh, and I think uh, the United States has taken itself to the edge where the world has listened us. And that edge is you are not doing enough. And then we told what we have done uh, for uh, this uh, alliance or for this relationship to maintain. And the world has actually knew that, uh, oh, look, this this is what the Pakistanis are saying, that we have done this, we have lost uh, economy, we have lost people, we have lost soldiers. And, and the United States is saying we have not done uh, enough. And then there is a $1 trillion war in Afghanistan. There, so if, if the, what they're saying, $30 billion or $33 billion, there is no comparison. The loss, the, the what we have got from Pakistan, it is unmatchable. This is unparalleled to what the Americans are saying. So uh, what I believe in this entire uh, uh, you know, situation is that Alice Wells didn't go to the GHQ. And this is where we have told that this is a tough message, that any if a uh, you know, uh, person like her stature is coming here and the GHQ didn't welcome, or if they welcome, there is no news of that. So definitely, she, if she had gone to the GHQ, that would have been in the news. Uh, so we have given a message, and tough message, for taking that back to Washington, that uh, the, the the military establishment is really thinking very tough for uh, uh, on the United States, because you are not accepting what uh, we have done for, for, for this alliance. Uh, so uh, what I believe, or what I have seen, is that uh, uh, the call that came from the CENTCOM chief, uh, 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 General, General Wortel, sorry, and uh, the call, and then now this visit. I think both of these visits, if we just look at collectively, we can understand that the Americans have realized. Um, and this is what I have been talking since long, that uh, State Department is not listened in White House. Uh, that is where the State Department understand the limitations of theirs, that they have certain limitations because they're actually dealing us on ground. They know that what these people are doing, what they, what are strengths, what are weaknesses. Uh, and then that article that came from uh, Ambassador Olson, also, uh, if it has not reached to the White House office of the president, that has been read by everyone in the State Department and people concerned with Pakistan and Afghanistan and the region that how we have to deal with. So they understand that our limitations are there. And I think uh, Pakistan has done so beautifully. It, this is the Americans who had to retreat. You know, even if you are a power and you are a great power, you cannot achieve all the outcomes. For example, uh, there's a very wonderful book, uh, The Future of Power, by Professor Joseph Nye says that the United States being a superpower uh, could not get uh, the desired outcomes in terms of sanctions in, 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 in two-third cases. So it, it doesn't mean that every time a great power, superpower, sanctions, or uh, it gets tough on someone, they will get an outcome. So in our case, they are not getting the outcome. And my perspective is also this, uh, that this time, U.S. sanctions will not work on Pakistan. This is my, I have written on this some six months ago, that U.S. sanctions will not work, although Pakistan has been the most sanctioned ally, the most allied ally, and uh, this is where we have, we have been with the, with the Americans. But this time, the, I think the State Department has started pushing them, look, uh, we have these limitations, I think. And what Alice Wells is going to take back to the United States, that is going to be a tough message, and, and they will let them know that uh, the GHQ guys didn't meet them. So, well, uh, uh, Bhutani Sahib, uh, taking a page from what uh, uh, Chima Sahib is saying, the, but Pakistan also did express their desire for a continuation of the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan on, based on mutual trust and respect. And moreover, uh, Alice Wells also spoke about enhanced intelligence cooperation to provide a basis for the improvement in ties between the U.S. Uh, and Pakistan in counterterrorism cooperation, which begs the question that what have we been doing for the past 15 years? Uh, definitely. I think, uh, first of all, uh, Pakistan's response or Pakistan's calculations, they are rational. I mean, this is a rational behavior. You cannot think about leaving a relationship like this. It's not a relationship between two human beings. It's between two states, and that too spanned uh, 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 upon the history of uh, six or seven decades. And uh, we have always been partners uh, since our inception. And there have been great uh, uh, highs and lows in this relationship. But Pakistan has always played instrumental role in, in U.S. strategic interests, as in uh, just, just think about C2 and CENTO. Pakistan was the only uh, member for, for, uh, of those organizations, but Pakistan was not part of those regions. Uh, then uh, think about uh, China-U.S. relationship. I mean, U.S. was dying to have this relationship. It wanted to corner the Soviet Union from China. And Pakistan played an instrumental role. It was not 
uh, US could not find any other uh, uh, channel, any other bridge which Pakistan provided them. Then talk about this uh, uh, war against Soviet Union, uh, the Cold War. In the Cold War context, Pakistan play, played the only pivotal and instrumental role. Uh, had this not been the case, I think the dynamics of world order, world politics would have been different today. Then in post 9-11, you see, we uh, changed our policy altogether and we also took up our arms against this terror, the menace of terrorism. And then the whole world have seen that technically we are the only country who have come up with a military strategy. Otherwise, all other countries have been doing something about maybe dealing with the terror financing, maybe banning some organization or uh, uh, talking on policy levels with the states. But on ground, militarily, tactically, it is only Pakistan which have which has uh, come up with a strategy how to deal with uh, this kind of militancy, how to deal with this kind of terrorism, because this was a new threat. Even United uh, forces of United States are still struggling. And then if you bring the whole debate to uh, this issue of uh, Haqqanis, I think that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, if, if you think about Haqqani, if you are making Haqqanis as a great force, uh, I think that, that's a miscalculation. I mean, compare, look at yourself, you look, 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 look at Haqqanis. Uh, I have never seen uh, that much influential presence of Haqqanis or instrumental roles of Haqqanis. Uh, I mean, we used to hear about Baitullah Masood, we used to hear about Hakimullah Masood, we used to hear about TTP and the TTP Sawat chapter and their presence. I mean, we have seen these actors in the game, but we have generally not seen very actively important Haqqanis or they have, we have not seen very significant characters. Uh, in post 9-11, yes, Haqqanis were really significant in pre-9-11. Uh, uh, the geopolitics. They were really the significant. They, we used to see all those pictures from Peshawar Consulate where they used to have tea parties. So uh, in those days we could figure out, we students of international politics, we could see them. But now we, am, we have not seen them. So just blaming uh, the whole scenario and scapegoating one country and then uh, bringing out this one very minor, very sub-tactical uh, actor and, and uh, creating a, 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 a huge hail out of a molehill. And I mean, I mean that, that's not uh, very much logical or rational. Absolutely. Now, uh, Chima Saab, one of the things that has been uh, missing from the discourse is about India's role in destabilizing Pakistan, also India using uh, the western border from Afghanistan to cause uh, destabilization activities within Pakistan, terrorism and whatnot. Uh, that conversation has been missing. Uh, why have the Americans not acknowledged India's role in destabilizing the region? and also the atrocities that they're committing constantly uh, in Kashmir and elsewhere? Well, I think uh, the tragedy that has been in this region is that uh, uh, even the last time we talked that the third party involvement uh, between India and Pakistan for not enhancing the peace process or for not letting both countries to come on the table has been, in fact, that has been the casualty uh, of for the region. Uh, for instance, it was the Americans or the British, they had they used to push in our India to come on table. Uh, so that had been, you know, the exercise in the past. But for quite some time, we have realized that India has uh, established its position globally in a way. Uh, and uh, while it is considered as a market, uh, that the leverage with the international community and especially the great powers used to have on India, that has reduced. So that is why uh, uh, they are now talking on Kashmir, in which your question you were saying, while knowing the atrocities are there. And at the same time, on other part, uh, on, on our part, uh, there has been uh, weaknesses that we didn't pursue the case very actively the way we should have pursued. For instance, after the Burhan Wani case, when we sent the emissaries globally, uh, we didn't follow that, you know, the emiss those emissaries didn't follow uh, the pattern that we need to go again and keep raising the opinion. Uh, so I think there has been fault on our side and there has been a strength of India, uh, which the global international community is not, uh, is not having a, uh, you know, is not pushing India for coming to, with Pakistan on table, one thing. Second, as you are talking about the destabilizing factor, since the Indian, uh, approach or since the global approach uh, about India is that India is fastly emerging a market one is capable enough and looking at the, uh, the, the the incumbent administration's understanding of Afghanistan that we need certain new partners who can help us build Afghanistan 
So the new administration believes India could be the one such partner that can build Afghanistan. And looking at the past trajectory, they have poured some $2 billion or something like that. They're making, uh, you know, the Afghan parliament or uh, uh, some other projects which have been done even on, on, on electricity and roads, infrastructure. So th India is considered in that way. So recently, uh, I think uh, with this meeting with Alice Wells, one thing has established that they have realized that we have to sit with Pakistan and we have to address the concerns and we have to go for the damage control that has been caused by the, uh, the Trump's tweet. So the next step that could happen that Pakistan can make the perspective more clearly to understand uh, to the Americans is that uh, this is where the trouble is that uh, Ask your uh, uh, the, the the White House to uh, to, to to have a you know more she strong wasn't... analysis. My question was regarding the uh, constant LOC violations, uh, which have been over seventy e even before the month of January is over, and that is also causing problems for Pakistani uh, security agencies to fight the war against terror. So they're always diverting Pakistan's attention from the terrorist fight. Uh, so well, that should be a, a, a situation that must be addressed. Well, I, I partially address that uh, that since the uh, the the international community's leverage on India has reduced, and a third party's role in this conflict has reduced, that is why we are seeing things are flaring up. Uh, for, for example, in this year there have been last year more than 1,000 LOC violations. We lost some 52 people, and other than the soldiers on this LOC, uh, there was an uprising in in Kashmir. So India trying to divert the attention that look LOC and Kashmir is connected. So they they go for LOC violations, and if there is an uprising in Kashmir, they just equate it with the LOC and equal the Kashmir problem is the same. That if this is India, that is this is Pakistan that is involved in it. The point is that we have to maintain a credibility on the Kashmir crisis that we have to continuously pursue this. When we lose uh, our temperament or our tempo or we get engaged in our own domestic politics or we do not put that into the category that we have to actually engage it. So we just realize that Pakistan just use it as a leverage. So we also have to uh, build our credibility. It doesn't mean that we are not talking. We are talking every time. But that momentum that needs to be seen. That momentum has come down. So they look at us and they look, they just instrumentalize this conflict to gain incentives or to uh, be tough on India. So I think this is not, uh, this impression must go. Oh, procrastination, you think, is the real problem here. <laughs> well, moving on, uh, Bhutani Saab, uh, one interesting thing that she also mentioned uh, was that uh, Washington opposed any effort to foment separatism inside Pakistan. Obviously, she was uh, alluding towards the Baloch uh, issue, and uh, she said the U.S. would not support the use of Afghan soil as a base for hostile acts against Pakistan. But that, again, clearly is not the case because we are constantly being uh, attacked from the Afghan side as well. Terrorist activities, if, if you look at the situation in Quetta, there have been like, while she was here, there were bomb blasts going on in Quetta, and people were being killed. So. What, what should we understand from I this? I think in international statement? politics, uh, uh, when messages are being communicated, there are different ways. Some things being said are different, but interpreted, when they are interpreted, they have different connotations. Uh, they have identified two aspects, two dynamics. One, uh, usage of Afghan soil against Pakistan. So it goes both ways. One that they have identified that, yes, uh, uh, the, the, the equation is just complete. Uh, initially, people used to say, or even Americans used to say, that Af uh, Pakistan soil is used against Afghanistan or against the forces in Afghanistan. But now, now they've agreed. Uh, but this is also, this can also be a message. And uh, same is the logic about Balochistan. One, she has recognized or she has given weightage to this issue. While pa state of Pakistan doesn't even give a minor weightage to whatever is there in Balochistan. Balochistan is, I mean, there is no issue in Balochistan, and uh, it, it's the end point of CPAC as well, and it's, it's quite uh, uh, stable. There are issues of terrorism, and uh, our military forces are dealing with that. But there are no issues of separatism. There were some voices in the past, but they have been uh, curtailed, contained, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, tamed. Uh, all, all of these processes have been done. But uh, a U.S. Uh, diplomat saying something about Balochistan, I think this is a message as well. Uh, on the face of it, yes, she say that, she's saying that we are supporting it. We will support uh, Pakistan's federation. But uh, there have been uh, other lobbies as well who have been 
working in that direction we have seen uh, these uh, taxi campaigns in uh, Europe and America both uh, just few weeks back uh, there was a campaign in New York uh, so I think this is a message this is somehow because uh, uh, they th on, on the back of their mind uh, they, they are also doing their uh, aggressive diplomacy uh, I'm not taking it positively being being, being a student right uh, uh, that, that, that's my take Okay, uh, Chima sir, would you like to comment on this particular aspect or b there's another uh, thing as well because she spoke about this moment of concern uh, in which uh, the bilateral uh, relationship between Pakistan and America uh, is uh, seeped with frustration and the happiness, unhappiness rather of the Americans is that they've not been able to form uh, or forge an effective partnership for, uh, to fight against terrorism. Now that sounds very strange coming from the Americans <coughs> um, and also that uh, the US was against countries distinguishing between good and bad terrorists. So we've already uh, clarified our point of view on that uh, point as well. Well I think uh, in my personal understanding uh, what I believe is that Pakistan need to be little offensive on the United States. They actually they need us. We need to put a lot of things on table and we need to engage them. And we need to have them, this is what we need, this is what we are doing. So put a lot of things on table and engage them. And I, I personally believe they will, they will understand that uh, this is not the Pakistan where we can just, you know, uh, the, the Pakistan of General Musharraf. This is the Pakistan of 2017 and the people are more resilient. People talk tough. People talk tough even before the state speaks. So even the state responds much later, but the people talk immediately. So I think in this situation, what uh, first of all, as I'm saying that we need to put things on table. It means we need to ask the United States to start the, that strategic dialogue with we, we started with the United States that is suspended. So if you do not start a strategic dialogue, it means that our relationship is uh, questionable. And if and and at, at this point where uh, and I think this is where the institutions matter and this is where the public opinion matter and I think the government of Pakistan and the institutions in Pakistan they have the right time to pressurize the United States that people and institutions in, in this country they want that United States to engage with us and this is where otherwise uh, we cannot convince the parliament we cannot convince the people it will be tough for us so if this is the time we need to throw the ball to the parliament's court and the parliament should be tough and these messages need to come up and and i think if the the institutions are real strength of any country then we must show that uh, strength that uh, that our institutions are demanding so here the parliamentary parties they need to be uh, uh, tough I, I know that the uh, parliamentary committee on national security they've asked for the presentation on the parks and u.s relations and they had that uh, uh, session because of the trump street but since the things are fine there is no follow-up that parliament's committee on national security what we have to move forward so uh, the parliament and the institutions need to tough and they need to be tough and i think the americans will understand this uh, in my understanding and uh, for that uh, the composite dialogue needs to start and uh, at the same time we didn't work from last 15 years that we have to the other than security there must be an alternative dependence that we need to establish of the United States on ours so the so this question must end that the world just need us that is why security state tag will be over when we we, we believe that they have other dependence on us that could be anything in region so uh, if uh, that the, getting more closer to China, getting more closer to Russia, that's fine. So other than Afghanistan, the world must think on us that this is where we need Pakistan. Well, they do need us for good doctors in the U.S. as well. <laughs> so that's one thing that we should maybe work on. But well, Batali Sahib, moving on, um, she also praised Pakistan's extraordinary fight against the Tehreek e Taliban, Pakistan and Jamaat ul Ahrar. And she said, that uh, the U.S. wanted similar efforts against groups trying to destabilize Afghanistan. And what have the American forces been doing in Afghanistan? Why have they not been able to deal with the forces that are destabilize, destabilizing Afghanistan from within? I mean, to be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, I mean, they, they should ask this question uh, to themselves, to their authorities, to their military chiefs, uh, and to, to all those planners and strategists who have pumped in billions and billions of dollars. That's how Trump says it. So, uh, and uh, they are quoting wrong figures about Pakistan while they have been, uh, I think, uh, I don't have the exact figure. I have them. So we'll talk about those figures so, as well. So, uh, the, 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 the amount of money that has been spent in Afghanistan, they need to ask questions. I mean, uh, there is this uh, anomaly of uh, Tora Bora operation. 
there is this anomaly of uh, many other operations which their uh, Senate committees have been discussing that there are some problems, there are some shortcomings, there are some uh, people who have been involved, there are some people who have been working with the other side. So uh, there have been issues, Pakistani troops are not uh, present in Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistani uh, troops or any instrument of Pakistan state has no presence and no access and due to this negative propaganda and all this uh, media gimmick which is funded by India and as well, general Pakistanis as in those who are diplomats, those who are working, those who are teaching there because uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan sociologically enjoys great relationships and uh, Afghanistan has been dependent on Pakistan. I mean, our teachers have been serving over there, our doctors have been serving over there. So they are also facing troubles now due to this anti-Pakistan sentiment that, that has been spilled and spinned in uh, Afghan society. So Pakistan does not enjoy this leverage uh, and uh, they all, uh, whatever happens, whatever incident takes place in Afghanistan, they immediately target Pakistan while uh, lastly they have seen that uh, uh, the, the public in Kabul they staged mass protests against their own security forces. So the question is for Afghan, uh, for U.S. authorities, that how uh, uh, how, how are you op operating? What is your success ratio? Uh, how much territory you have captured? How much ammunition you have used? It's only Bagram Air Base and uh, outside Bagram Air Base you have no military success. I mean that's that's really uh, a, a very great question. Somebody should do research on that. Absolutely. Well, uh, Chima Saab, uh, one of the things that she articulated was Washington's aim. Uh, in Afghanistan was to find a negotiated political settlement and uh, this is where she expected or rather the US expected Pakistan to play its role. Now what kind of a role do they expect Pakistan to play in the internal affairs of <coughs> Afghanistan where we're talking about a political solution maybe getting the Taliban on the negotiating table which Pakistan has been proposing and uh, 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 also um, you know promoting Unfortunately, uh, that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, again, we come back to the rhetoric of uh, we, we want a win in Afghanistan and there is no such thing. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, as Pakistan has already supported Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process, uh, which nev is never Afghan-led, by the way. <laughs> this is always <laughs> led by others. Uh, but um, uh, the statement that comes from us, this is what we support. Um, I, what I think in Afghanistan is that uh, the internal, uh, the political leadership need to move forward in this. And I think the discord at home is dangerous. Uh, the political leadership in Afghanistan, I believe, they do not have the capability to move forward or they can have the Taliban into the fold. I have said that many times, there is a big slice and they all have to share it in any way. Taliban at one day has to be part of the Afghan establishment, Afghan government. So what's taking so long? I mean, we've been hearing about this and talking about it for, for the, ever since the Afghan conflict started. Uh, it's, we're still talking about it. Yeah, you know, the point is that if uh, there are Murray talks, they reveal that Mullah Omar is dead. If uh, Mullah Mansour is the new head of the Afghan so Taliban, it's this cloak and uh, dagger approach that we have to deal with, so, unfortunately. So, when we are having you people on the board and we ask you whatever that is, when you are coming on table, we are discussing and this QCG process is there. And I think there is no outcome of that. So, uh, who releases the uh, news of Mullah Omar and that after two years? If he was dead, he was dead. But after two years, when the process is moving forward, and then when Mullah Mansoor is the man who's in charge, then he is dead. The point is that what we want is that if, if you really need to uh, ask support, get our support. People talk about the people have doubt on our, our capability even to have Taliban and, and Taliban on table. Yes, there is there could be probability in this situation when we do not have a control on the Americans or we don't have a control on the Afghans. Uh, and when Afghanistan's president goes into on India and says that we do not welcome Pakistan to bring a Taliban on table and sitting saying something in New Delhi that is having some significance <coughs> for us. Uh, the Afghan president Ashraf Ghani is on board saying he is openly said that in New Delhi when he visited, I think, a year ago in, Afghan in India. So uh, I believe that uh, 
Afghan leadership, they need to be more sincere with their people. They are not sincere. Remember, Ashraf, who is Ashraf Ghani? He was, he was the one who was working for the World Bank. He just came a few years back and he's just wearing the, the local dress of Afghanistan. And he started using his tribe, no, a tribe name along with him. Earlier, he was just a man who was living in London, Paris, New York, Washington. That is the elite. I think the elite need to decide it. The people at home, they're at ground, they're just, uh, they're worried. And even, you know, the, the, uh, the, the surrounding countries, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, they feel very upset. I mean, Many of the diplomats whom we meet here, someone said even me that uh, the, our trade is being damaged because uh, our uh, fruits that come from Central Asia, the Afghans mark them as their fruit and they send it to Pakistan. People have a lot of troubles with Afghanistan and this is not just Pakistan. And we have been saying that 45% territory with the Taliban in Afghanistan, then uh, who can control that and who can fight and and and, and the, the the contract between the afghans and the americans is that the americans will not fight with the afghan taliban and and now they are talking of we are going to have an offensive against taliban and this is what pakistan says if there is offensive who will control the aftershocks of the offensive if it is unsuccessful like many others unsuccessful offensives. Well, i'm trying to decipher what the u.s really intends and what they want because if you just look at the statements of alice wells she says that the u.s uh, had set no preconditions for talks with the uh, with the Taliban. Now that is uh, contrary to the facts because uh, the condition is that they they want to first militarily defeat them and then bring them to the <laughs> negotiating table as they have previously articulated. Never. Then going on from there, they also said that the uh, objective was to prevent the Taliban from winning, which also has an acknowledgement in this statement that the Taliban are winning. Are winning. So that is a big question, and then. Uh, she also wanted to say that the Taliban were a part of the social and political fabric of the society and uh, the, the U.S. wanted all these interests to be brought to and settled on the negotiating table. But then why do they insist on, on first uh, beating the uh, Taliban on the battlefield and forcing them onto the negotiating table? Why is there this disconnect between uh, what Alice Wells is saying and then what we hear from the other American administration officials? I think uh, the new American administration is really struggling with uh, articulating their policies and strategizing for uh, not only Afghanistan but uh, all different avenues that they are engaged in. You know, look at uh, the crisis in Middle East, look at the uh, environmental issues and their uh, agreements on climate and look at their uh, international business cooperation with, with different consortiums and organizations. So they are struggling. Uh, you have rightly pointed out that uh, there, there is this ambivalence uh, in their approach. On one hand, they are saying that we want to engage them. On the other hand, they are saying that we want to defeat them. And they are also implying that we could not defeat them in the last 15 or 16 years. And <coughs> that, is, that is particularly our point that then do not scapegoat us. I mean, uh, we have done our part. We, we have defeated them wherever they wa were. We have played our part. They were in Sawat and uh, all of your media outlets were making headlines that uh, uh, they are just 100 miles away from Islamabad and then we have seen that uh, Sawat is quite peaceful right now and it's very clear and uh, all those elements uh, who were in Sawat are now residing in Nuristan in Afghanistan. Uh, then we also did something in Waziristan uh, and when we uh, deem that, th that that's appropriate and that's the right time, though uh, the North Waziristan operation was the uh, was a demand but when we uh, uh, thought that it's required it's important we did it and and now the whole area is under pakistan's control uh, so uh, they, this ambivalence and this confusion in u.s uh, strategy and policy i think that is not leading them anywhere because as uh, kamar al also referred earlier that there is this great disconnect between the state department and uh, the, white uh, the white house because uh, uh, the close associates of trump and trump himself He's playing on the, uh, uh, the uh, politics of earlier uh, era of Bush, like the, the kind of uh, uh, politics that Bush used to do, as in create a monster and then uh, uh, create a scary impact of that monster and then tell the American people that I'm the one who, who is really uh, 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 worried about you and you need to elect me and select me. Because the public opinion and his popularity graph has been, I mean, nose diving. So uh, he uh, does something in, a, in every 15 to 20 days uh, regarding North Korea, regarding Pakistan, and regarding all these other Israel. Uh, major Israel as well. So that he is in the news and he's, he's trying to reiterate that, yes, I am the man. I am saving America. Uh, America is under great threat. 
and there are all these issues. So, he is playing on this politics of uh, somehow how to, how to spell it, I don't know. So, of, does it mean of, that of, what, of if, we, hate if we try to analyze all the statements of Alice Wells put together, does it kind of indicate or mean that they want Pakistan to take on the Afghan Taliban and fight their battle for them? Is that I mean, they should come implying? up clearly. <laughs> is that, if that's is that the case, implying? they should come up clearly. And I mean, <laughs> because it, we fail to understand what exactly they're trying to say when they're completely saying two opposite things in the same breath. <laughs> so it makes problems. I mean, you they know, should for, be very clear about it if they want uh, this case. And Pakistan has got its own options, and Pakistan has got its own. Uh, Let's also impact. talk about the the figures <coughs> that that we were mentioning earlier. Uh, Pakistan has claimed more than twenty three billion dollars uh, in reimbursements, uh, Chima Saab from the U.S. between 2001 and 2017. Uh, they have only received about $14 billion out of the 23 that we have said that we've spent already. Um, all these reimbursements are supposed to be from the Coalition Support Fund, which is meant to support the war against terrorism. So I don't know how the support is going to <laughs> continue with the, and how this battle is going to be won, despite cutting off all the you know, forms of support. Uh, lastly, uh, Historically speaking, the U.S. economic assistance to Pakistan has remained around 1% of Pakistan's budget. Uh, and we feel that this deficit can be fulfilled from other means. So <laughs> what are we really talking about here, Jima <laughs> Well, I think uh, if you just look at the political sense of all this, uh, of having giving this impression we gave $33 billion, if you j just go for the social analysis, what how people have responded to this, it was a kind of a mickery, you know, the way people made mockery of President Trump and the American aid, uh, that was, you know, this is laughable, there should be some sort of a drama or some sort of, uh, you know, play on that, that how, and, and, and I think in some ways some a university sitcom or a live, <laughs> or what you call the reality show. It's reality show on that, <laughs> yeah. that the people actually realize that, look, what you have given us, people are not in a mood to even listen you gave us. And why people, this is not that just they're making mockery. This is why, because people believe one thing, we lost so much. And you are talking that we gave you money. How can you forget the way when we lost the peace in KPK? Can we forget those days when, you know, every other day there was a suicide bomb in KPK and how the officers lost their lives and now that is we are seeing in Balochistan, even in Karachi. Yesterday attempt at uh, uh, Rawan Var SSP, even the SSP, uh, As As Aslam Chaudhary was assassinated because he was fighting against Al-Qaeda. So we fought well and the way society and the our law enforcement agencies have fought, I think that must be appreciated. And, you know, with every statement that comes from the United States is now this word is added that we really we really recognize the sacrifices Pakistan has given. That word is added every time, you know, even in the State Department or the Defense Department, not I think the White House, they have a different approach. So they realized that how we have to uh, respond. So had uh, they realized the public mood uh, and, you know, uh, they, the Americans must have understood that uh, all what we have given that has gone to the, you know, ditch somewhere, people don't recognize. But I think the elite or the people who have, as uh, Salman Sa was mentioning, that uh, the Fulbright scholarships or the aid that is coming and the, you know, the soft power they have tried to have in this country, that has been recognized, people understand. But uh, one man, the person who has it, you would call it the attention deficit disorder, uh, Donald Trump, uh, and this attention deficit disorder, everything, you know, that is he, how swiftly he can uh, 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 thrash away whatever the soft power the Americans were having here in Pakistan. I remember in the last days of Hillary Clinton, when she used to come here and speak, when having a talk with the society, media and people, look what we have done for you. And you know she was very she, the way she was communicating that was that was very marvelous and uh, people were feeling if Americans have done something good for us. But look, one person with one tweet, how he can damage the image of his country and one thing, whatever they have done in the last 16 years, clean slate now. And I think the government now started from clean state. Yeah, look, what we have, what you have done, we don't, we don't remember it, and the people don't remember it. So let's move forward from here. We're talking about moving forward, uh, <laughs> uh, the Afghan refugee issue is also a very serious one now. Uh, 1.4 million Afghan refugees that are registered, uh, the federal government has uh, decided to prepare a contingency plan for their return now. So. Salman, in your opinion, uh, how important is it 
especially in the fight against terrorism and also for Pakistan's own social stability to actually have these Afghan refugees repatriated back to their country. Well, there is no question about the importance and significance of repatriation as in uh, they have also they have been given great space uh, in our socio-economic fabric for the last 30, 35 years. Uh, th that should be recognized as well. Uh, my contention is that uh, if the repatriation process takes place, it should be in uh, the Afghan government should be taken in confidence one and <coughs> all these Afghan refugees should be repatriated in a very respectable manner. I mean, uh, we have given uh, space to them for the last 30 years and now we do not want to create this impression because uh, uh, there are forces, there will be forces who would try to uh, somehow kill our, uh, uh, our influence, somehow kill our, uh, 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 the, the space that we have provided, our role. So we need to save our role as well, that, that we need that uh, appreciation, we deserve that appreciation. Uh, because we are the only country who have given, not only uh, given them space, but they were even, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not sanctioned, they were not being pushed hard by the state, they were not being issued uh, numbers like other states. Even and Iran had... Uh, also, if you look at the way uh, the Western countries reacted or behaved with the refugees from Syria and elsewhere from the Middle East, uh, that shows them somebody should show them the mirror when it comes to talking about Afghan refugees in Pakistan. Yes, the kind of hospitality that we have extended to them and right now uh, actually Pakistan government is funding education of Afghan youth. Uh, every year around 6,000 Afghan youth are coming and they are being admitted in Pakistani universities, leading universities in medical colleges and in engineering universities. It's a great initiative, I really support that. Uh, that's what neighbors should do, that's what, uh, uh, that's what we are, that, that's, that is the actual face of Pakistan. But this kind of uh, uh, overtures should be advertised as well. And again, coming back to repatriation, uh, with the help of United Nations, with the help of United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, not only the world should recognize our, uh, our role, our, uh, our, uh, our significance, that, that, that the role that we have played, uh, rather we, we should be facilitated in this process. But and this is a test case for Afghanistan as well. But unfortunately, we're, fa we're facing resistance because the government has already given an extension for one month. Their visas or their stay expired on the 31st of December. We extended it till the 31st of January. And now the government is not in no mood of extending it further. But uh, officials that are dealing with this from the UNHCR and other agencies are, are talking about the uh, return of the Afghans of not being an easy task. Uh, they say it, it requires at least one more year. Uh, they also talk about the tripartite agreement under which uh, the government cannot just kick out the Afghans and then the elders in the uh, uh, shura of the Afghans, they have also uh, tried to you know, pressurize the government uh, to not take this step. Uh, so how is that going to actually uh, happen? How are we going to make sure that the Afghans uh, do go back to their own country because there are problems that we are also dealing with. I think the Afghan government needs to realize the responsibility. It's a great responsibility on their shoulders. Uh, they need to talk to Pakistani counterparts. They need to channelize the ways and means to re-establish uh, the Afghan nationals uh, in their uh, society, in their social fabric. It's been uh, a lot of time now and they have been making tall claims as well. So if they are making tall claims and they have problems with the state of Pakistan as well, no, the first instance instance would be that they should create some viable and better space for all these Afghans. That yes, we because have been, according uh, to an Afghan elder, uh, 400,000 <coughs> refugees went back to Afghanistan last year under the voluntary return program and 100,000 of those came back. And the reason they came back was because the Afghan government did not provide them with the required facilities. So, Vakas, I know some of the business families who are doing their businesses in Pakistan they repatriated and because they had money as well, they were very well established and they just came back after three, four months because there are no business opportunities, there are no health facilities, there are no basic amenities and now they are living on their visas. I mean, they, they, they are traveling with Afghan passports like foreigners. Otherwise, they were staying very comfortably in Pakistan and nobody used to uh, uh, bother uh, touch them. them, bother them. But now uh, they are going through all these official processes, but they want to stay in Pakistan, they want to do business in Pakistan because they say that Afghan government is not cooperating with us. And uh, last week there had been the jirga of elders 
of uh, Afghans as well in Peshawar and they've really demanded from Pakistan government that uh, there should be uh, an amicable solution, there should be a middle way. They want at least three to five <coughs> years uh, to continue to stay in Pakistan and then slowly be repatriated to Af Afghanistan. Do you think that's a workable solution, Shima Saab, in your opinion, <coughs> considering the way the situation is so fluid between <coughs> Afghanistan think, and Pakistan? I think one, one thing is fine that at least the debate has started that we have to send them back, one thing. Uh, we just started it looking at the behavior of the Afghans. I think that should be known. Earlier, the way we were stopped and we were not talking of them, they were, either the UNHCR is paying or the way the cost is being paid by us, not by the UNHCR. Some few hundred dollars if they are giving to any individual or a family, that is, not, that is not sufficient. Upon definite. return. Yeah, on return, upon return. The point is that we face that. Uh, at least the debate has started. Uh, looking at the poverty, lack of infrastructure and the facilities in, in Afghanistan, how can they believe that we can stay there? So they know that how we, how we have the facilities in this country and we have survived and you know, equal uh, opportunities for business and moving forward. Although we, we got damaged by the Afghans in many ways, uh, but somehow uh, had the, this card Pakistan is playing, uh, in my understanding, that we will send the uh, refugees back. Uh, why? Because uh, the Afghans were not listening. The government was not listening. And if the and I think while well, we send them back, the, there is no change in the Afghan mood. I mean, I'm talking about the government's mood. So they don't bother about that. If we are sending them back because you know, uh, they're fine, if you're sending them, they never talk to us. There is no meeting, you know, here that look, uh, we don't want them to back. Please have them for a few years. So Pakistan wanted to have some leverage with this, but Pakistan couldn't have leverage, so we actually sent them back. So, uh, so I think we should uh, work on that. Uh, but uh, it is good for us to make the Afghans realize that uh, we need to keep on talking to them, look, this is what we have. Okay, we're almost out of time, so before we close the program, one important thing that's uh, come up is about the uh, amount of arms that India is amassing, especially for their troops on the borders, which is with Pakistan and, of course, with China as well. <coughs> uh, they have become the world's largest uh, defense importer in the world. Since uh, <laughs> well, uh, now, seeing that the number of uh, weapons that they're amassing on the border, very quickly, uh, how is that going to help in uh, regional peace? J just a one-liner, I mean, uh, there, uh, the military industrial complex that has developed in India is pressurizing, it's influencing the media, the legislature to rationalize their purchases. That's why you see that there is uh, 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 this upsurge in LOC firings. There are these uh, uh, rash statements from responsible people in the Indian military and in the Indian uh, cabinet uh, because actually everybody is justifying those 54, 55 billion dollars and purchases like this. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for taking out the time and sharing your views with PTV World. You heard the conversation and uh, I would urge you to draw your own conclusions, but we hope that uh, uh, peace returns to this region and indeed to the entire world and uh, we hope that double speak is not employed when we talk about peace. With that, on that uh, note, it's goodbye.